Hallelujah. Well, I'm excited to be uh, standing here again to deliver the Word of God to you. I, I love uh, preaching the Word of God. I love teaching uh, in the Scriptures. And so I'm going to ask you if you would open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Now, the title of my message today, and uh, we will be uh, going through a number of fundamentals. Uh, the title of my message is Living Inside Out. Living Inside Out. Uh, I've been meditating on this for quite a while, but I heard at the conference I was at just a few weeks ago, I heard Kenneth Copeland say something that I thought encapsulated this. He said this, Spiritual things are from the inside out, but natural things are from the outside in. Spiritual things are from the inside out, Natural things are from the outside in. You know, Jesus said, uh, talked about uh, when he was questioned about washing of the hands. You know, someone said, hey, hey, how come your disciples aren't washing their hands before they... He said, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but it's what comes out. You know, the natural, natural things that go in, I mean, it can, it can make you sick, but it's not necessarily going to defile, defile you in the same way. But what comes out of, the, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And so there's a there's spiritual force that comes out of you. So Proverbs chapter 4, let's go there, verse 20. And we see this. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ears to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes and keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. And what I want you to understand there is as we, as we again allow that word of God to come around our lives to renew our lives, uh, as we allow that word to be rich in our hearts, to allow it to come out of our mouths with that heart belief, we find that the issues of life, the power of God, the, the, the dynamic of that anointing, the Mashiach, that anointing that comes upon you and, and, and dwells within you, uh, can be manifest. God, God has, has put so much in His Word concerning how, how those words connected to the heart, connected to the Spirit, uh, produce life. Out of it comes the issues of life. Well, how does it get from inside here in your spirit? How does it get from in here to out there? It comes out by the vessel of words. That's the same way God created in, in Genesis chapter 1. The Spirit of God was hovering. Don't you love that picture? He's just hovering, man. I mean, he, he, I, I think the, the Holy Spirit was the, the original can't keep still kid. <laughs> and I don't mean that irreverently, but he was just, he's so full of life, so full of light. You know, have you ever seen those kids that can't keep still? It's just that, just, just, man, they're just hovering over everything, man. And I, I just the Holy Spirit was so excited about what was coming next, but he, he never, ever, ever independently acts apart from the Word of God. So he's hovering. I mean, the Holy Spirit is, is, is functions in light. I mean, 186,000 miles per second. I mean, he just can't keep still. But he's, and he's hovering, waiting. And all of a sudden, God says, Light, be! And the Holy Spirit explodes into power and action and accompanies that word. Man, well, how did it happen? It came out of the midst of God through the vessel of words. And light bead. <laughs> That's not good English, but you know what I'm saying. It was. Light happened. And it was days later that God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. Days later. There was no physical source or circumstance to produce that light. It happened because it was contained within the vessel of the words of God. Amen. 
And so God says the same thing here. Out of your heart, out of what's deep on the inside of you, out of your spirit, comes the issues of life. What are you speaking? What are you declaring? What what have you connected in your heart to from the Word of God that will come out of your mouth, that will establish things in your life? These are things we need to ponder on. These, these are things we need to understand. So over the next little while, we're going to be looking at some fundamentals. We're going to, you know, we need to rightly divide the Word of God. There, there are many things that, that you can hear. I mean, I, I, t- I don't know about you, but I've, I've switched on Christian television a number of times and switched it off just as quick. I thought, there, <laughs> I can't listen to that. It's not rightly divided. It's out of balance. It's out of kilter. It's, it's, it's un- you know... And, and, and we, there are some fundamental things that we need to establish and re-establish at times, and probably on an annual basis in our lives. To rightly divide the word of truth, a, 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 a friend of mine, a, a great minister of God, um, and a great encourager to me personally, a, a, a man named Dr. Laurie Al- Ollison, Larry Ollison. Did I say Laurie Allison? <laughs> Larry Ollison. Uh, He'll be here in Australia later this year. Uh, And he's just recently written a a new book. And and in the first pages, he talks about this rightly dividing the Word of God. And he says, to rightly divide the Word of God, you have to understand three things. I thought this was absolutely brilliant, the way he put this. He said, first of all, you have to understand that you are a tripart being. And we'll get back to that in a minute in, in some detail. You're a tripart being. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. To understand that, to rightly divide the word of truth, you have to have an understanding of that. What is, what is ministering, uh, and what it, what it is when it's talking about the soul, what it is when it's talking about the spirit, what it is when it's talking about your flesh. To understand the difference between those things. Like I said, we'll get back to that in a minute. You also have to understand um, that there are three types of peoples on the earth. There, is, there are the Jews... There is the church, and there is the world. And we have to understand those three different things. Now, when a Jewish person receives Yeshua as their Mashiach, Jesus as their Messiah, they become one new man in Christ Jesus and become a part of the church. They're no less Jewish, but they have now become part of the one one new man in Christ Jesus. But there is a, a, a purpose, a prophetic purpose, that God still has for the nation of Israel and for the Jewish people on this planet. And if the church negates to understand that, we will not rightly divide the word of truth. There's a whole bunch of scriptures that will be taken out of context. You have to understand, when you look at a scripture, who it was written to, who it is addressing. Now, all scripture, all scripture is good for us. All scripture we can learn from. Every single part of it. All scripture, the Bible says, is God-breathed. Amen? Amen? So every part of it is good for us. But not not all Scripture is written to the church, but all Scripture is written for the church. So we have to understand that. We have to understand those different parts, those things. So so there are three types of people on the earth. You are spirit, you are soul, and you are body. Understand the tripart person of man. You also have to understand, and this this is very key, the difference between righteousness and holiness. If you miss the difference between righteousness and holiness and get them mixed up, you'll end up in religion. And so understanding those three keys unlocks and enables you to to rightly divide the word of truth when it concerns all the different doctrinal matters. If you keep those three things in mind. So over the next few months, I'm going to be addressing some of those things. Today I want to talk about that living from the inside out and specifically looking into this spirit, soul, and body, the tripart person of man. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's lay a foundation for our understanding of this. There's many people that teach that the soul and the spirit are the same thing. They are intrinsically connected, but they are not the same thing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Thessalonians is in the T section of your New Testament, just in case you're wondering. All the T books are together. That was very nice of the people who collated this. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 23 says this. Now may the God of peace himself 
sanctify you, which means to separate, to, to separate you apart, completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, oftentimes when you ask people who, who've heard a little bit about this kind of thing about the tripart uh, makeup of man, the way God uh, made us, often you say, well, there's three parts to people. What are they? And people say body, soul, and spirit. And people often naturally describe it that way because they first go to the part that is so more obvious to them. The body, the outward. This is what you see on the outside, first and foremost. But actually the Scripture says it the other way around. The Scripture puts more emphasis and, and prominence first on your spirit. That you are a spirit. That's who you are. That's who you will eternally be. A spirit. You have a soul. Your soul, your mind, will, and emotions is not who you are. It's an expression of you. But it's not who you are in essence. Your body is not who you are. This is not who you are. Praise the Lord. It is your earth suit. <laughs> it's your container. It contains your spirit. And so we see spirit, soul, and body be, prefers, be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has a, 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 a plan in place right now that is keeping you. But we need to understand some things. We need to study how the Father made us. We, we have to identify and separate between the three parts of man so that we can... Again, rightly divide the word of truth when we're reading these things because there are times when different doctrines come along and grab a hold of a concept and you can see it and they'll, they'll prove it with Scripture. But if you have a wrong concept of that, of that dynamic itself, then what you've proven to be, even though you've proven it, is you've proven it to be wrong even when you think you're right. I know that sounds a little confusing, but we, we, we addressed this a few weeks ago when we talked about the difference between mercy and grace. If you, if you redefine a word from the moment you de redefine it, if you make it out to be something that it's not, from the moment you've redefined it, you can, st you can prove your point in the Scriptures concerning that word, but concerning a redefinition of that word. So we have to understand and go back and use the law of Genesis in the Bible and we have to see what was the first time those words are used. What is the first understanding, the first context? And we have to bring that as a common thread right throughout Scripture. See that re-established in the New Testament again. It's consistent. It's consistent. The Word of God is consistent. God is, is so consistent. In fact, James says there is uh, no variation or shadow of turning in Him. He's not changing. He's not a man that he should lie. He, he doesn't change. He says, I, he says, I change not. That's good to know, isn't it? Is, is, if you want, need something consistent in your life, God is the consistency. Praise the Lord. So how do, we, how do we disseminate? How do we figure out the difference between soul and spirit? Well, you in the natural can't. But we have a wonderful scripture in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Let's go there and have a look. Because in and of yourself, you can't. When, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and he talked about being born again, he, he basically what Jesus was saying to him is, is Nicodemus, as, as, as great as you are in the Word, as much of a ruler in Israel as you might be, you're never going to be understand the spiritually discerned things with a, in a state where your spirit is not in a place that's been born again. Regenerate. And so let's look at this. Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the Word of God is living and powerful. Now, when God says something, it never ceases to exist. That, that word rings for eternity. It echoes throughout eternity as truth. Now, God's never going to do this, but just as by way of example, if one day God decided to declare that 2 plus 2 equaled 7, from that moment, all of physics would adjust to line up with that, that would, which would now be truth because God said it. Now, he's not going to do that because he's consistent. Like I said, he changes not. But I wanted you to understand the concept of that, that when God speaks, it is eternally true. 
when he releases those words. He says, the word of God is living and powerful. The word of God is alive. It's alive. It never, it doesn't just, he's not just spoken and then once the echo of that word finishes in our natural hearing, it drops off. No, that word is alive. It's living. It's powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword. What does that mean? It just simply means the, the sharpest implement that you can imagine. Today we might use the word a scalpel. That might be the sharpest blade that we could possibly find. To do what? To divide. To cut between. To, to be able to identify the difference of what? Piercing even to the division of soul and spirit. So scripturally we can see that the Word of God, it's very hard to discern in and of yourself, but scripturally we can understand that in the Word of God, when we allow the Word of God to, it will come in and accurately and skillfully give us a division between the two so we can understand how the two function. Soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the wonderful Word of God. Why is this important? For the Christian... Believer, it makes all the difference. It makes the difference from just being saved and going to heaven and, and living a, a, a normal life. You know, you can be saved and still be going to heaven and never live up to all that's been provided for you. Never, never, never walk in that blessing. If you don't understand how, you, how that you are a spirit, if you don't understand how to divide the difference between the two, you'll never learn how to live from the inside out. And that will, that will stop you from living out the heavenly life now. The heavenly life now. From, from now and all throughout eternity. Now, now, we know we've not crossed over into the millennial reign of Christ just yet. That, that's that's not, not too far away, I believe. That mess, messianic reign... Jesus will put his feet on the Mount of Olives and there will be a thousand year rule and reign, perfect government under Jesus himself. You can get excited about that if you want. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Eh? I mean, it's going to be phenomenal. But God has given us the capacity, the ability to taste of that even now in the way that we can live as regenerate, born again spirits even while we're contained within this natural format. Even before we, we transition. But if you don't understand this, you will live a natural life. And I've joked with you about this before. You know, oftentimes I hear people, especially people that are trying to be real blokey blokes, well, I'm just not very spiritual. <laughs> or whatever. You know what I'm saying? And that is really, if, you know, if that's coming out of the mouth of a Christian, it's ridiculous. It's right, it's right, Rodney, it's silly. Because how can you, as a spirit, say you're not spiritual? It makes no sense. What you're saying is, I don't give any focus on my spirit. I'm living out of my soul. That's a completely different thing. So we need to rightly divide this. Why am, I, why am I focusing on this? I really believe, I really believe the Lord has put a, a strong emphasis in my heart to teach, to teach this, for us to get this. I, how many of you, and you don't have to put your hand up, but I just want to ask this to, your, to, to you for your question, uh, for you to question your own heart, your own mind. How many of you could be at the place where you're absolutely fed up, absolutely had enough of, of, of of life just seeming, seemingly walking over the top of you. C circumstances keep coming over the top of you. Things just keep seeming to happen around you. And, and, and there's, the Bible teaches very, very con consistently, very, very clearly, that you, would, you don't have to put up with that. There is a completely different way of living. As a Christian, you are not supposed to live the way you used to ju and just go to church. Now, I'm not talking about you having to line up with a bunch of laws. I'm talking about you now being empowered that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in you. That there is an, there is an enablement on the inside of you, but you can never do that from the outside in. So many people are trying to get good enough to be spiritual. 
You can't. It's the other way around. Once you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, He's done everything possible to make you right with Him. That's, and that's where holiness and righteousness differs. You can't earn righteousness. The blood of Jesus earned it for you. He did everything for you. He's made you righteous. And yet so many people are still trying through, uh, through religious activity to be right with God. He's already done that. Now, holiness is a different issue. That, we'll discuss that at, at another time. But, but you've got to understand that, that righteousness is what you've been made. That's who you are. You've been made the righteousness of God. We'll look at scriptures for that in just a little, little while. But unless we, unless we are prepared, unless we have gotten to the end of our frustration, because you know what? You'll put, up with a, you'll put up with a lot for years. But you've got to come to that place. And, and I remember uh, Kenneth Copeland telling this story one time, and I forget the details or who it was involved, whether it was him or someone else. But he gave the story about a, a guy who was sitting next to a, a, a man of God and he was you know, being discipled by him and everything else. And, uh, and the young man asked the older uh, man of God, he said, you know, uh, what do I need to do to really be successful in the ministry? And the older man grabbed the guy's head and put it under the water and held it there, like, for quite a while. And eventually pulled it up, and the guy went, oh, what did you do that for? He said, when you want this as much as you wanted your next breath. <laughs> because... But seriously, because we can be so blasé about life. And oh yeah, I'll read my Bible, yeah, oh yeah, you know, go to church, whatever. And I'm not talking about religious activity to earn you something. I'm talking about a hunger and a thirst to walk in the footsteps of Jesus throughout your life, to be Jesus on this planet to people, to be the body of Christ. There's, there's not enough time for us to muck around with, with living the old life. Jaden and I were standing in, our, uh, in my driveway uh, not long ago, and we were just talking about a concept where, where the Bible talks about putting off the old man. And, and, and that, that, that terminology came from a, a form of torture that used to be done uh, in New Testament days where if they wanted to really torture you badly, what they would do is strap a dead body to your back. And the dead flesh would start to eat away your flesh and you would start to die from the outside in. Isn't that awful? And so Paul says, throw off the old man. <laughs> Why would you walk around with death strapped to you, eating at you, but put on the new man in Christ Jesus? This is the choice that we have. Because you can walk around and you may be going to heaven and still there's an old man strapped to your back. Heck, it's got nothing to do with the fact that you've been made. You are righteous. You can, you, God that doesn't make God love you any less or any more. None of those things are the issue we're talking about here. You are approved. You've been, you've been uh, qualified in Him. All of those things are absolutely sure and true. But you can, you can die and go to heaven and not have fulfilled what God called you to do not have lived in the fullness of life because you never learn to live from the inside out. Have you, have you noticed that the things don't just fall on your head? You don't just wake up one morning, walk out into the driveway, and something, you know, a, a million dollars falls on your head. Have you noticed that's, that's just not automatic? But could it be God's will for you to uh, have the power to get that kind of wealth? Absolutely. Has he already done everything to enable you to step into that kind of wealth? Absolutely. But do you have to, by faith, appropriate that in your life? Yes. Has it got anything to do with your righteousness? No. He's made you completely right. That's not the issue. That's not the issue at all. If you don't allow revelation from the Word of God to minister to you, the division of soul and spirit then you may live from the inside out, but it may be your soul directing your life. There's a soul's on the inside of you too. 
So we're not talking now about then a soulish led life. When I was in Africa, uh, 1987, um, the Lord told me to read my Bible all the way through, cover to cover. And I was not that long a Christian. I was out in the mission field already, and so I hadn't read my Bible all the way through at that point. And he told me to read it all the way through. I did, cover to cover. And I didn't graduate high school, so you know, I was not uh, intellectual. I, was not, I had read one book in, the, in my entire life, famous five, five goes somewhere. And... <laughs> And, and so it was, and it was a massive effort. I mean, I, I, even now, I still read at the speed that I'm speaking to you now. I'd, Jill can read a book in the afternoon. It takes me three months, you know. <laughs> but no, I'm getting, I shouldn't say that. I'm getting much, much better at that now, much quicker after how many years. But, but it was an effort. But the thing that it did is because I was reading at that pace, I soaked in as, as much as I could. And... Uh, the, the Lord directed me, he said, now I wanted you to do that because you needed to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And what was happening is the more I would spend in time in the Word and the longer I'd spend in the day reading the Word of God, the more my mind, my thinking started to adjust and line up with those scriptures. With the way the scriptures... Because so, if you read the Bible all in one go, and this year I'm, uh, I go through the Bible every year as well as other many other studies, but this year I'm doing a chronological uh, reading of the scriptures. Uh, which, is a, which is a lot of fun because it's as it happened in order. I encourage you to do the same thing if you'd like to. Um, but as I went through and I read these things, I found my, my thinking adjusted. I would go to say something or do something and a scripture would come to mind which would make that adjustment, make that transition, make that paradigm. And, and it was amazing to me how that, how that happened. And I thought to myself, this is wonderful. It, I, now I can live my life out of a renewed mind. And, and the Lord said to me, nah, that's still wrong. I thought, no, hang on a minute. I'm sure, I'm sure the Bible said to be transformed by the renewing of my mind that I may prove and attest what is his good and pleasing and perfect will. And, and uh, that's correct. That scripture is correct. The Lord said to me, yes, but I ne have never called you to live out of your, uh, uh, or, or direct your life out of your soul. I called you and created you to live your life out of your spirit and the reason that you need to renew your mind is so that it stops arguing with your spirit. So that it stops conflicting with your spirit. Because your spirit is the part that has been made righteous. Your spirit is the part that has been connected with the Holy Spirit. And, and uh, anything imperfect cannot be connected with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holy by definition, separated from everything else. And so when your spirit was made brand new, it was made perfect. The problem is not your spirit. The problem is the soul that still has in its memory banks a whole bunch of wrong thinking, philosophies, arguments, pretensions, and everything else that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. The Bible calls those strongholds. And we have to tear those down. We have to, we have to renew our minds. We have to renew these things. So this is important for us to understand. And many, many times <clears throat> when I've been counseling people, talking to people, praying for people, uh, people come to me about, about the future, ministry, and all sorts of things, I hear them say this. Now, this is not always necessarily wrong in terms of what they're saying, but, but sometimes what they're saying is right, but, but the angle they come from is not necessarily accurate. And I hear them say this. I just feel like the Lord's saying this. Now, that's not wrong in itself because we, there is an inner witness that leads us. But if a person has never understood this and the Word of God divided between soul and spirit, then they don't know the difference between an emotional feeling and a spiritual leading. And it's oftentimes that that person will come three months later and say, I just now feel like, like, Lord, like God's changed his mind. <laughs> and all they're doing is that their own emotions, feelings, circumstances and everything else are pushing them around and they've religiousized it and put their own words on it and it wasn't God in the first place. And actually that's close to getting blasphemous. Putting God's name on something that, that, that you've made up out of your own emotions. It's dangerous stuff. Why? Why is it dangerous stuff? Not because God's going to come out of heaven and slap you over the head. It's dangerous stuff because if you live your life like that, you're going to find yourself just pushed around by every wind of doctrine, by every little circumstance that comes along. 
You know, we've got to rightly divide the word of truth, and we've got to be stable in this. We've got to be right down the middle of the road here on this. We've got to understand this. We've got to do it by faith. The Bible says in James that an un- unstable man, uh, a person who's, who's, who's in this way uh, blown around, is unstable in all of his ways. If he's double-minded. No, we've got to understand what the Word of God says. So we don't want to just... Yeah, now, I'm not saying it's, not, it's wrong to say, I just feel like God's saying this, because at times I'll say it that way, and I know it, and it's in my spirit. It's come out of my spirit. I've prayed it through, and, and now I have some words to put to that inclination or that leading of the spirit on the inside of me. But I'll only say that if I have already discerned that this was not too much pizza from the night before. And you need to be able to test that. There's too much flaky in the church. Anyway. (laughs) So there's three things here that we need to develop. We need to develop an intimacy in following the Holy Spirit. We need to allow the Word of God to shape and renew our soul. And we need to have a sensitivity and a submission to our own spirit, our soul, our mind, will, and emotions, our own body needs to come into subjection and submission to our own spirit, which is in unison with the Holy Spirit. If none of the above is true in a person's life, in a Christian's life, it's more likely that they're going to be ruled by their own mind, their own emotions, continually. It's, now, you can see a person who's run by their soul, and I'm not, I don't want you to judge anyone else around you. Just, just, I want you to focus on you for a moment just to see if this might ring true for your own life. Have you ever found, have you ever found your, your, that your emotions just seem to lead the way you do things? I, I, I've seen people where I've gone up to them and said, hello, and it's like I've offended them. <laughs> and he said, Hello. And then the next day, I don't say anything because I don't want to offend them. And I offend them because I didn't say hello. <laughs> there, are so, there are people in life that walk, that walk around and, and, and it's, again, I want us just to look at ourselves. Do, do I line up with that? Am I easily offended? Am I easily pushed around? Am I easily moved by circumstances? When that unexpected bill shows up, does that completely ruin all, my whole day? Is, is my mind, my will, and my emotions uh, so, so uh, out in front, so in charge of my life that these little things that happen, that, that, uh, these little explosions that take place, that I'm, I'm, react, I'm reacting like this to them all the time? Is, is that how I live my life? No, well, that's not how we're supposed to live our life. If none, of the, if none of those things, those three things I said, developing an intimacy with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Word of God to shape and renew our soul, and sensitivity and submission to the Holy Spirit, if none of those things are true, then it's more likely that we're ruled by our own mind or emotions. Now, in the life of a Christian, that's called religion. Religion is someone trying to live a spiritual life through natural means. i say that again. Religion is someone trying to live a spiritual life through natural means. Okay? Trying to apply. That's what people try to do. And again, we try to, people, religion often tries to push you into a direction where you, you're trying to please God in the sense of to get His love or to get His, His, His approval when that has already been done by the blood of Jesus. Now, we do want to please God. We, we do want our actions and our, and our works to be pleasing to the Lord. But not because we're trying to get Him to love us. Not because we're trying to get Him to approve us. That has already been done. It's the working out of our salvation through fear and trembling. It's the application of our life. What we've already been given. You have so much from God residing on the inside of you. So much inside of you ready to be let out onto the world. I mean, seriously. Heaven will back you from the inside out. But the problem is, too many of us are trying to live from the outside in. And what happens is when you do it that way, guess, what, get, guess where the focus ends up? Me. 
I become the focus. And there's a wonderful scripture that you've heard me talk about before uh, that, that kind of encapsulates this. Um, it says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's living from the inside out. But what most people try to do is if I can just control the flesh, then I can walk in the Spirit. And that's completely backwards. That's religion. No, you're already a spirit, born again, connected by the power, with the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. Now start walking it out, and it, in doing so, will control the flesh. Not the other way around. Not the other way around. When Jesus is the Word, the Torah made flesh, came without sin, he demonstrated that Adam could have walked in this perfection kind of lifestyle. Jesus came, and specifically we're taught, incarnate, in the flesh. That means he did what he did, not because he was God, but because he, was, he came in a flesh suit, a man suit, with, and God came upon him. He was specifically baptized in the Holy Spirit to empower him to do what he needed to do, to prove and to show and to become the ultimate sacrifice and substitute for man as a man. And then he turned around and said, the things that I do, you do, and greater works than these. So that enabled him to come upon us. So it wasn't, he didn't do it because it was God, because otherwise there's no way he can turn around and say that to us, because we're not God. But he said it to us as people, because he as a person, with the, with the power of God on him, did those things. Now, when he is the, the Torah made flesh, came without sin, he demonstrated that Adam could have lived this kind of perfection. John chapter 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was, uh, the word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld the, His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So through the death and resurrection of Jesus, the pathway was forged for us through his blood for a natural man who was in spiritual death to come over into spiritual life for that spirit man now to be connected and as at home in the heavenlies as on the earth. Your physical body now houses your spirit just as it houses the, the you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your spirit dwells within you. But you are as much at home in, he in the heavenlies as you are on the earth because of that. The Bible says that we are seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because we are vitally connected to Him in the Spirit. There's much of a life. You know, there are some amphibious beings, uh, uh, animals, that have uh, eyes that are, have got a divider in the middle of them. The bottom part of their eye is designed to look under the water. The top part of their eye is designed to, live, to look above the water and be in perfect focus in both things. If, you, if you've swam underwater, you know that, that these lenses don't do a great job. The natural human lenses don't do a great job underwater. You've got to put on some glass or some kind of uh, thing to, to, so that you can see. Well, these, these amphibious animals have got eyes that do both. As Christians, we need to develop the same kind of sight so we can walk around here and, and not have our eyes closed to, the, to, you know, to walk around. I mean, you, you, you've got to live here. We're in the world, but not of it, right? So you've still got to figure out, you've still got to apply spiritual truth to the things around you. I mean, otherwise you'd be the spiritual superman and walking around and never see anybody that needs healing. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? So we've got to be able to see here and see here at the same time. And I believe that's how Jesus functioned. He would walk into a situation, he would see the natural, but he'd also see what the Father was doing at the same time. He said, I don't do anything but what I see my Father do. He would see both things going on at the same time. He would superimpose one picture upon the other and actually enforce that which changed that. that. Why? He was living from the inside out. He was living from the directives of God out into the world. He would take what God said, what he saw God do, and he would literally bring that from heaven to earth. And he told us, he said for us to be praying this, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our commission. It's a great commission. 
Praise the Lord. Uh, Rabbi Nossam Sherman and Rabbi Mir Slowitz uh, commented on this in the stone edition of the Chumash that Adam was created to be a speaking spirit. That was their commentary on uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And they said that based on that and Onkelos and the different statements that he made, uh, that they declare that that was God created man to be a speaking spirit. Now what that means, that's very significant, because what that means is that, that God was, man was created to be like God in the way he spoke. That he was given a voice, as a spirit given a voice, to operate in the same way verbally and spiritually as the Father does. Well, that would make sense. He created us in His image and in His likeness. But if you haven't divided between soul and spirit, then you're going to be confused in there. So, let's talk about the born-again spirit. The pneuma. P-N-E-U-M-A. In the Greek. The born-again spirit is no longer in contestation. It is made righteous not because of your efforts, religion, or good works. 1 Peter 1.23 says this, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? 2 Corinthians 5.17-18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. All things have Passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is now, this is talking about your spirit. How many of you realize, re- realize that when you got born again, you didn't suddenly think perfectly? Anybody realize that? That all of a sudden the mind wasn't completely washed and, and you still had the capacity to say a swear word or, or anything like that? Remember that? I remember that. <laughs> oh, not with you, I mean with me. <laughs> <clears throat> No, this is talking about, now all things have passed away. All things have become new. How many is all? All really means all. It really does mean all. And then in verse 18 says, and specifically, now all things are of God. Now in your spirit, where your spirit is concerned, it is of God. All of it. No part of your spirit is now attached to the soul, or, or, or I should say is to attach to a sinful nature. None of it. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to Himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So that reconciliation that you've gotten in that, in that dynamic has been the same ministry that you've been given to go out there and preach the gospel to bring other people back into that supernatural dynamic of grace, of love, of power, of faith. Praise God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 just a few verses later, says, For he made him who knew no sin. Who is that? Jesus. To be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How righteous is God? There is no, th- there is no thing more righteous than God. And he's made you the righteousness of God. It doesn't get any more righteous than that. Through, through your own efforts? Absolutely nothing that you did other than receive the gift. Praise the Lord. So that's the spirit. That's your spirit. What about your soul? The soul of a born-again person. The soul is the gateway to your spirit and your heart. What do I mean by that? Well, how did you get born again? You had to make a decision. Okay, so your will was involved. Your mind was involved. Your mouth got involved out of your heart. What does Romans chapter 10 tell us? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. One of the most dynamic spiritual explosions of life that you will ever understand or know happened in that moment of salvation. And it happened because your soul got into agreement that it became the window for that. Your mouth, your heart, all got in alignment and and allowed that spiritual transaction to take place. 
And it's the same now. When you believe in your heart, when that scripture gets a grip with you, when your mind is being renewed and you allow that transaction to take place and the Spirit of God brings a place of revelation and your heart believes and your mouth speaks, it connects your spirit to the outside. You're literally going from the inside out. Praise the Lord. It's a release from inside of you out to outside of you. Your, your soul decides how you were led. It makes the decision to submit to the leading of your spirit and the Holy Spirit. The soul of a born-again believer needs to now be renewed and led in its thinking decisions and emotional responses. So our spirit is supposed to, supposed to lead us, but our soul decides what will lead us. So the soul, your soul has to come to the place. You have to be renewed in the spirit of your mind to the place where your soul makes a decision. That's it. From this moment on, I submit myself to my spirit, which is connected and submitted to the Holy Spirit. And then in that place of submission, your soul, your body, will then allow your spirit to lead you. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the removal of your mind? No. <laughs> by the renewal of your mind. By the renewal of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our mind needs to be renewed. It didn't get transformed when we got born again like our spirit did. It now takes some effort to submit to our spirit, because when it does, our spirit will, because of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, and our spirit is just following right along with that. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness and with greediness. But you have not so learned the anointing, Christ, Mashiach. If indeed you have heard Him, the anointed one, and have been taught by Him, Really, that's talking about the Holy Spirit. Have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Put it off. You still have to do that. God didn't pull it off you. Now, not when, again, we're not talking about your spirit now. Completely different subject. This is your soul. This is your soul. You can still go to heaven. But there's a better way to live while you're here. Put off the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. So you're not just putting something off. There's something to put back on again. There's something to envelop you and clothe you. Again, which will completely change your life. The way you think, the way you act, the way you do what you're called to do. Your soul is not made righteous when your spirit is born again. However, it does become holy through obedience to the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. There's a, you, you have to pursue holiness. That's a biblical thing for a believer Born again, sanctified Christian to do. You have to pursue that sanctification. You have to pursue that holiness. Chase after it. Go for it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Again, this is not talking about your spirit. Your approval in God through the blood of Jesus. It's just talking about 
living that life out now in the spirit of holiness. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as He who called you is holy, is He holy? As He is holy, is He holy? Yeah. You also be holy. This is the New Testament. <laughs> Through what? Religious efforts and, and striving and, and your own, your own, your own soulish uh, uh, strength? No. Through the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given on the inside of you. Through the grace enablement that has empowered you to live out from the inside. It gets stressful and straining and gives you a migraine when you try to do it in your soul. We've got to finally learn how to do this from the inside out. I'll finish that scripture, verse 16, because as is written, be holy for I am holy. So he's quoting the Old Testament. What about the body? This physical thing. Body of a born again believer. Did that, did that get immediately trans, uh, transcended, transferred, transitioned, whatever the word might be? Pick one of those, you'll be right. <laughs> when you got born again? No. You didn't wake up and look in the mirror and hardly recognize yourself. Wow, look at that glorified body. That didn't happen. Now, is that yet to happen? Yeah, absolutely. So what about now? Your body simply your earth suit. And if God hadn't done it this way, you would have had to have left the planet when you got born again. If God had transitioned you at that moment so that you got a glorified body with the earth in its current fallen state, you would have had to have left the earth. You literally would have shot up. It would have, your body would have repelled the earth. Now that will happen fairly soon. And there'll be a trumpet blast, a, 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 a teruah, a shofar will blast, and, and there will be a changing of your bodies, and, it, and you will like, I mean, it'll be like Rocket Man has nothing on this deal. <laughs> this is going to be fun. And we will meet the Lord in the air. That's going to be good. Listen, you can get excited about that. This is in our future. This is in our very near and coming soon future. I believe it. I believe it. So your body is simply your earth suit. If your spirit leaves the body, it will cease to function independently. I mean, you can keep a body alive with machines, but if there's no spirit in there, it's, it's futile. If it's gone. The hardest thing hardest thing would be to try and bring a Christian back from heaven. Now, now, sinner who's hanging over hell, maybe that you call them back and they'll come back into their bodies. But, but somebody who's born again and they're in heaven, very difficult. I mean, don't go around to funerals of born again Christians trying to raise them from the dead. They, I mean, when Smith Wigglesworth brought his wife back, she scolded him. She said, what do you do that for? <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. I mean, come on. Huh. Your earthly body will either cease to work and decay or be caught up in the catching away of the saints. In both cases, there will be a regeneration of the body into both a natural and spiritual state. But this resurrection body will be possessed by your spirit. Praise the Lord. The body of a born-again believer at this time is temporarily still in a more a natural state than a spiritual one. But the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee of the purchased possession. Let's just look at quickly at these couple of scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. This is his plan, to bring together heaven and earth. For them not to be as separate as they are now, as divided, but to reunite in him. In him also, verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who are first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. 
In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. And that, all that's saying is, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you now is the guarantee of what He has already purchased that you will inherit at that point of resurrection life. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of you will give you as much life as that purchased possession, only you have to stay in this one right now. But that doesn't mean this, this thing has to get sick. It doesn't mean this thing has to get depressed. It doesn't mean you have to have chemical imbalances. It doesn't mean any of that. Why? Well, look at this verse in Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's what we've just been talking about, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Praise the Lord for that. So even though to to qualify to stay on this planet, and the whole purpose of that is so that we can win the loss to Jesus and fulfill out the prophecies concerning Israel until the time of the Gentiles comes to a close. The whole purpose of that, walking that out, and both of those, by the way, are are linked intrinsically together. The whole purpose of you staying in your bodies is to work that out. And and, and, and if, if you got born again and just immediately beam me up, Scotty, and you were in heaven, then there's no one left here to, to fulfill that great commission. And so God said, would you just stay in your bodies, but let me tell you, you don't have to put up with anything concerning the attack on your body, because my Holy Spirit will be in you, and the very life of Him in you will give life to your bodies. But you still have to believe that. That only works if you believe that. These signs shall follow those who believe. All right. So 2 Corinthians 5 then says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. When when Adam and Eve saw themselves naked, it was because that heavenly habitation was no longer covering them. Man was crowned, covered with glory and honor. We groan at weight again for that clothing. So for who we who are in this tent groan being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Isn't that wonderful? The guarantee of the purchase possession. The Spirit is the guarantee. Praise the Lord. So what does all that mean for you? Quite simply, everything necessary to live a victorious life has been done and supplied for you by the grace of God. You now have the responsibility to apply the gift of God to your life through His Word. To bring that soul into a place of submission, under the mission of your spirit, connected to the Holy Spirit. We simply need to submit to the work of grace and throw off the old man. To stop fighting what God has already supplied for you. God did not make this difficult. He's, supplied, he's done everything possible to make this as easy as possible. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's hard work when you fight against it. So, I think I'll call it a day there. A day there. Praise the Lord. Living from the inside out. In fact, there's no other way for a Christian to really live. If you're living any other way, you're not really living. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ now lives in me. The life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself you're going to truly live, you have to live it from within. That's how this works. Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand up for a moment?
Has this encouraged you today? Stirred you up? Praise the Lord. Because there is not enough time left on God's calendar. There's not enough time left on God's calendar for us to be Christians who are going to heaven and living like the world. The power of God that He wants to release, the miracles that He wants to see take place on this planet in these days ahead, the manifestations of His glory which He has preordained for us to walk in, don't just happen because we're living like the world. They happen because we get ourselves in agreement and alignment as vessels fit for the Master's use. And we walk out that salvation and that empowerment, that enablement. And it's time, it's time to live from the inside out. That means there are going to be things that come across your path this week that are screaming for your attention and you're going to have to ignore them for a moment and, Lord, what are you saying first? You're going to have to learn not to react but to respond by the Spirit. And we, you, you, you continue to live in the flesh, in the natural if you want to, but it's going to be continual hard work. And you're just never going to feel fulfilled. So just give up. Give up. Seriously. Like, throw it all away. Throw all of that effort away and simply start walking in the Spirit. Simply start living from the inside out. Don't trust your own thinking. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. Simple as that. Hallelujah. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord in a place of surrender, lifting up holy hands, separated. And let's say this together. Father, we determine today as born again, spirit-filled, regenerate, full of life and light believers that we will submit ourselves, spirit, soul and body, to the will of the Holy Spirit. And our souls, mind, will, and emotions, and our bodies, we submit to our spirit in the name of Jesus. We believe the Word of God, the grace of God, the love of God, and we receive those things empowering us to walk out in these days the life of God from the inside out. We declare this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now go into this week. Don't walk into Monday and not think about this message. <laughs> Seriously. It'll be online by, I don't know, Tuesday night or something, as quick as we can get it. And the video will be online soon as well, on Vimeo or Face or, or uh, YouTube. Get it, put it on a CD, put it on an MP3 player, put it in your car on the way to work. Listen, let yourself, let your own spirit meditate on it. Let your soul be renewed in, in the spirit of your mind in this. Let it be so much that this week just you are consumed in this word so that it literally explodes on you from the inside out. You can't help but live from the inside out. Amen? Well, I got excited today. <laughs> Praise the Lord.